Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Café Ole. My name is Jay. I'm a volunteer with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah with Nefesh Benefesh. And here at Café Ole, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need here in Israel to succeed, whether that's um, paying your bills, much less reading your bills, going grocery shopping and reading nutritional labels, keeping up with the news, striking up a conversation, flirting, going on a job interview, getting into an argument, all the everyday conversations and everyday use of language, you know from your respective countries of origin, but here in Israel. As always, we wanna hear from you what topics you'd like us to discuss. You can write that if you're joining us here live on Zoom in the chat window. Otherwise, you can email us at nefeshbenefesh. You can also go to youtube.com and see all of our previous lessons. There's a playlist um, already set up if you just type in Cafe Ole or if you type in um, either Cafe Ole or uh, Nefesh Benefesh, you'll see a playlist of all of our previous lessons very easy to get to. Uh, I just saw that someone had an issue with hearing me. Can you all hear me? Great, thank you for that. Okay, if you can't hear me, please, uh, I think it's on your side, not mine. Um, right, one more piece of news, uh, uh, sorry, just housekeeping rather. Um, if you have any questions about this specific lesson we're about to start, please write in the Q&A. Any other ideas? concepts, topics, criticisms, complaints, please write it in the chat window. I'll only be looking at the Q&A for this lesson. We also have two more lessons left in this summer session before we take a break um, for the summer. So any further topics you have, otherwise you'll have all summer long, or at least the rest of the summer, to go over our previous lessons. So today, uh, uh, most important, I want to wish all the Canadians in here, I hope you had a happy Yom Canada, Yom Canada Sameach this past uh, 1st of July. And to all my fellow Americans here, a Yom Atzma'ut Sameach, a happy 4th of July. Those are the two ways we say it in Hebrew. Right, so let's get to today's class. Today's class is about emotions and emotional spectrum. Not asking you to open up um, in our little bit of time here into um, that type of session, but rather go a little bit more in depth into some of the words you'll hear on a regular basis to describe how we're doing or how someone else is doing, how to ask that question, and also get into a little bit of grammar as we get into some words that you're going to hear quite often um, and see how interrelated a lot of these words are and also how you can... Um, uh, how you can increase your vocabulary very quickly. And it's a topic we've talked about a lot with the use of the shoresh, the root of words in Hebrew, as well as the mishkal or the binyan, the format of words. And you're gonna see how that plays out really nicely when we talk about emotions. So with that, let's open up today's class. Um, so as always, Hebrew is going to be in the middle with the dots and bars that indicate vowel sounds called nikud. You don't normally see this um, in writing, in everyday writing. Uh, transliteration on the right-hand side, English on the left, and notes. We're going to go through these words. There's a lot more notes that are here. You'll remember, and you can go back to our playlist on youtube.com, that we've done um, how, small talk. Small talk meaning how do you start a conversation. We've talked about versus manishma and echolech and all the different ways we can say how are you doing, right? To start a conversation. Here we're adding an additional question because you can use all of those to get an answer that's about emotions and how you're feeling. But this is more direct about how do you feel. Before we get to how do you feel, which I'm sure some of you already know how to ask the question, we have to talk about a few verbs that sound very similar in meaning to to feel. First off, the one we're going to use a lot today, which is lehargish or lehargish, depending on how you say the letter resh here in row two. Lehargish means to feel in the emotional sense. Um, we don't use this in anything other than emotions. So what you're feeling inside, it can be externalized, of course, but it has to do with emotions, feelings. Okay, lehargish. That is the infinitive. This is as opposed to lachush. Lachush can mean to sense, as I um, translated it here. It can also mean to feel, but it's to feel in a physical sense. Um, trusha is a sense or a sensation. Lachush is really to sense in a, or to feel in the physical sense. Um, 
your five senses, chamesh hatchushot in Hebrew. Okay, so lachush is more to sense rather than to feel emotionally. It's to sense or to feel physically. It's not to touch. That's a different verb altogether. This is, we're talking about feelings here. Okay, and also a verb that will come up a lot when we're talking about how to describe oneself is simply the verb to be, lihiot. Um, remember, lihiot is not conjugated in the present tense. We simply use the pronoun. So, ani, if I want to say, I'm happy, ani sameach, right? We're actually going to get to another um, different verbs for that. But if I want to say something else, ani, I'm tired, ani ayif, I am tired. The I am is contained within the ani, okay? Ayef is not necessarily an a emotion, but they all get mixed up when you're ayef, when you're tired, right? Okay, let's get to how do you feel, right? This is more direct than asking manishma or mashlumcha, how are you, right? You're not necessarily asking for emotions. It could simply be a write-off reply, or as we've talked about before, you'll often hear friends or in an informal encounter go through five, three, four, five different rounds of asking each other manishma before you finally answer it. Instead, you're, you're deferring to the other person to answer out of respect. Here, though, we're asking straight out in Hebrew, how do you feel? How do you say this? If you're saying it, if you're asking a man or someone who identifies as male, ech ata margish, or ech ata margish, and to a woman, ech at margisha, how do you feel? Either one, depending on the gender, ech ata margish, to a man, to a woman. Okay, and then the way you would answer this is just like I said before, you don't have to use the verb to feel. You can simply just say ani, right? If I want to say, um, I feel happy, right? I can say ani malgish sameach, but more often than not, and really more, most of the time, you're just going to hear ani sameach, okay? I'm happy. You don't have to repeat the verb again, okay? So, ani sameach or ani margish sameach. I am happy or I feel happy, right? There's a difference in meaning. Of course, there's a difference in the amount of words that you're using and the, the words themselves, but they convey the same thing, okay? Let's get to some more answers. Echat margish or echat margisha. These are the ones I'm going to say these are on a bit of a spectrum. You're going to see they actually go back and forth, and there's a good reason why. But these are sort of the general answers that you would also give, by the way, to mashlomcha or manishma or echolech or ma'amatzav. How are you? As much as how do you feel? Okay, again, because not everyone's going to be open about their emotions as emotive as Israelis can be. Culturally, they're not always the most emotionally open when you're first talking, let alone in general among friends. Okay, so some of these are, you would categorize as feelings, some of these are not, or they open up to a more bigger conversation about feelings, which we'll get to in a little bit. So first, let's start with I'm well, or I'm good. Ani betov or ani malgish tov or Ani Betov. Now, this is an important one because you're going to hear both, and there is a distinction in conjugation, and this is very important for those of you who are scared about conjugation and gender. This is a good workaround. When you, you simply use the word Tov to describe, and it means, by the way, in Hebrew, both good and well, um, you can say Ani Tov to a, for a man. For a woman, Ani Tova. This needs to be conjugated. Right, so if ani malgish tov, at you female at malgisha tova, ani malgish tov, I feel well. You singular female malgisha tova. Okay, it has to be conjugated when we use the word tov, tov, tova, tovim, tovot. And what you'll see on the left hand side, under notes and usage, I'm going to put in there the prefix of when it gets conjugated, if it gets conjugated, and if so, what is the, sorry, the suffix um, based on gender? Because some words, when they're conjugated for female, are going to change their ending from one letter to another. In this case, tov for female becomes tova. The workaround is the word ani betov. Ani betov is technically a um, I am well. And in Hebrew, well, like in English, is an adverb because it's modifying am, and therefore it's not conjugated. So I can say ani betov, and I can say at betov. Okay, this one does not conjugate when you use that b before the word tov. If you're just simply saying ani tov, 
you have to conjugate it. Anibetov, no conjugation necessary. So a nice workaround for those of you who are still struggling with gender and conjugation, simply by answering in a, albeit in a very bland sense, I'm good or I'm well. Okay, another way to answer that, ani besedo, or simply besedo. Besedo, beseder, or as we've talked about before in slang, the very American inflected accent, beseder, all mean okay. It literally means in order, but it translates into English as okay. All right, let's go through some others. Kaha kaha. Kaha kaha is a good one. We've talked about this word before, actually. Um, it is the equivalent in um, Hebrew as the French komsi komsa. It is so so. It actually also translates well into English as so so. Right? Kaha kaha. Echata malgish. Eh, kaha kaha. Right? You can add that eh at the beginning to really emphasize and illustrate so so. But nonetheless, um, kaha kaha on its own, you will always say with that sort of so so voice and intonation as well. This is a good one um, you may not have heard before, but it's heard all the time, it's used all the time, um, and it doesn't translate well, which is also why um, many native English speakers are reticent to use it, or you just won't hear it among fellow ulim. Is lo mashu. Lo mashu literally translates to not anything or not something, but it translates best as not so well. Okay, the flip side of this, by the way, in slang is mashu mashu. Something that's really something something, as we say in English, the opposite, lo mashu. So if someone asks you, echat magisha, and you answer lo mashu, it means you're not doing so well. That could be physically, that could be mentally, emotionally, um, in all sorts of ways. Oh, I see there's an issue with the, um, hold on just a second. Sorry, just had a technical issue there. Just one minute. Oh, sorry. Just one minute, folks. I'll be with you in a second. Okay. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay, back on the screen. All right, so like I said, lo mashu is um, not doing so well. Okay, lo mashu. Um, again, physically or emotionally, either one works. Okay, let's talk about some positive ones and then we're gonna, you'll see it flip flaps back and forth. Mitsuyan, you know this one well, Mitsuyan means excellent. Um, it comes from the same root as siyun, which is grade, to grade something. Um, Mitsuyan is excellent. And you'll see here there's a taf that I wrote here in little letters on the left hand side. That's because when we conjugate this for um, female, it's Mitsuyanet with the taf at the end. Okay, so Mitsuyan, Mitsuyanet. I put those in there just not to, not only to not have to conjugate the full table for each word, but that you can start recognizing patterns in the words. That if a word ends in a certain letter, that when it becomes female, it gets a certain letter added to it. So in this case, Mitsuyan becomes Mitsuyanet. Okay, Mitsuyanim, Mitsuyanot. We talk, talked about these words a few weeks ago. Always important to um, go over them again. Akhla and Sababa. Akhla and Sababa, like many words in Hebrew slang, come from Arabic. They both mean awesome. Awesome, great. All of those words you can think of if you were a child of the 80s or around in the 80s, tubular, gnarly, all of that is what it's meant here. Um, these are, like I said, positive words through and through. They're slang. Um, just like with all positive words, you can use them sarcastically, but these don't have any sarcastic value in and of themselves unless you're speaking as such. Akhla and Sababa both mean awesome or great. This, however, is a tricky one. And this one's really important to, um, to be able to use and to master as a Hebrew speaker here in Israel, which is chaval al-hazman. Chaval al-hazman is um, an expression, it's an idiom, and it can mean both awesome and terrible. And it's all about context and it's all about your voice, how you say this. Chaval al-hazman, was originally an expression that was terrible. That meant something was terrible. Okay, chaval al azman. Chaval means too bad or um, travesty or something that's bad. Al hazman on the time. It is a idiom, so it does not translate literally. Though you will hear um, both native Hebrew speakers and people making fun of Hebrew speakers saying too bad on the time. 
Okay, this does not translate literally. Please don't translate this literally or write in the Q&A, but this doesn't make sense. It is an idiom through and through. The original idiomatic expression meant something was terrible. You're feeling terrible, something else is terrible, whatever it is, it's bad. But what happened, just like in the, um, just like in American slang, bad became something good, right? We all know the song, we all know how that happened in the 70s and 80s, bad became something good. So now when you say khawal al azman, you need to be careful about context because it could also mean something's really good or in this case, awesome. Right, this is not a word you're going to use in a formal situation unless it's absolutely clear it's awesome or terrible. If you're speaking to a friend and you have a smile on your face and you go to give them a hug or a high five and they ask you, Bona makure, yo, what's going on? And you say, azman, it's clear you're doing well. Okay, that context, that cultural context makes it abundantly clear you're doing well. Chaval azman needs to be categorized. And if you can ace this one in terms of all the nonverbal communication, in terms of intonation, you got it down pat. Just like the word bad in English. Think of that usage of the word bad in English will help you with chaval al-azman. This one is also an idiom. This one will always be terrible or bad. If you say that you are ala panim, ani malgish ala panim, or ani al panim, it means I'm not doing well can mean terrible, but it simply can mean I'm not doing well. Again, physically as well as emotionally. Or everything is terrible today. Okay, alapanim is also an idiom. Do not translate literally. It simply means terrible in modern Hebrew. Okay, so here's the spectrum. Obviously, obviously there are many, many, many more words. We're gonna go into a few now, um, but these are the basic spectrum from really terrible to really good. Okay. By the way, you would never answer someone necessarily tov me'od, right? How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Just like in English, I hope you don't, I don't, you don't speak like that in English. You're not gonna say that in Hebrew. So I know you learned tov me'od when you're in class in Ulpan or in school in terms of grades. You would not say tov me'od in that context of someone just simply asking you how you're doing. Very well, thank you. That's what it sounds like, at least to me. And I rarely hear people answer like that, except if they're writing text in a very sort of structured way. Okay, let's move on to some ways, better ways to say, speaking of which, tov me'od, because I don't want you to answer that. I want, and Mitsuyan gets a little boring after a while. Ahran Sababa may be a little too slangy for you, as well as some of the other ones. Let's use, expand the word tov. Hebrew, we've talked about, is a conservative language in the amount of words that it has. But it had, when it delves deep into a word, and we've talked about this before, like all the different verbs to, um, that we use for to wear something or to get dressed, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of words to indicate something is positive, it's good. All of these are great words to describe how you're doing if you're doing well, besides tov and besides mitsuyan. So let's start at the beginning with a little bit of context for each of them. First off, nehedal. Nehedal, as you see here on the left, also um, when it becomes feminine, it takes a taf at the end. So nehederet, we've talked a lot about the um, Israeli satire show, Eretz Nehederet, it's a wonderful country. That's what this, where this word comes from. Nehedal means great or wonderful. It comes from the root of it is hadal, he daled resh. Um, best to think of splendor. So splendid is also a way to translate um, nehedal, but this is a great word um, to describe when something is wonderful or great or you are doing well, wonderful or great. Nehedal, nehedal, nehederet for a woman. Another one, this one I like because you really have to be super emotive to use this word, mehamem, right? You Even way just saying it, I can't say mehamem. You have to say mehamem. You really have to emphasize this word. Mehamem means, is best translated, I think, as fabulous, okay? Why? Ani pashut mehamem. At pashut mehamemet. You are simply fabulous, okay? That's the context of this word. Um, it comes from the same root, Hey, mem, mem, as to stun or to overwhelm. So it's understood that this idea of being fabulous, you are stunning, right? You are overwhelming, but in a positive way. So stunning is the better way to literally translate this word. 
but fabulous is also the the real um, the um, connotation rather than the denotation here. Okay, nifla. Nifla, you've probably heard a lot before. You probably think it is a synonym of nehedal, and it is. They both mean great. They both mean wonderful. Nifla has the same root, pe lamed aleph. You see here in the middle, right? Let me just highlight that, pe lamed aleph. Um, that comes from the same root as wonder, right? Um, the original name of cell phones in Hebrew is pelephone. Why? Because the idea is that it's wonder and it's a phone, Pelephone. That's the, the name of the first cellular company in Israel, Pelephone. And that's become the catch-all term like a Xerox or Kleenex in American English to a cell phone. Okay, so Pelephone. Um, Pelephone from that same root, Nifla. Wonderful, great um, Nifla, Nifla-a, Nifla-im, Nifla-ot. Okay, that Aleph at the end, is part of the root. It is not the same as a hey at the end of a word. So it's nifla'a for a woman or for something feminine. I love this word. This word, um, just like in English, we sometimes over-exaggerate and by a little, sometimes we do it a lot, especially here in Israel, especially here in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. This is a great word that we will often describe about ourselves or about something we've done or about someone else. Um, maybe not so much emotions, but certainly emotive when we use it, is mushlam. Mushlam means perfect. Okay, lahashlim is to complete something. Um, and that is the form of the verb that we're taking mushlam from. Something is completed. It is complete, meaning perfect. You'll also hear in slang, mush. Right, we talked about before slang, many words in slang end in ush or ish, the letter shin in particular. And we take just the first syllable of mushlam and we turn it into mush. And you'll hear this a lot in someone explaining or emoting how they're feeling and they'll say simply mush, right? Mem, vav, shin, that is short for mushlam. So if you have a teenager at home, now you know what they mean when they say mush. Um, mush, interestingly enough, is also the name of a new snack that has come onto the market. I have not tried this yet. It is apparently cotton candy made out of dietary fibers. The idea of it sounds repulsive, but at least it's somewhat healthy. And it's called mush with about five different vavs in the middle. So mushlam, or for short, mush, perfect. Let's get into some words. I love these three words. And these three words are really important in understanding how they're formed and how they're used and gets into our next section of um, emotive words and emotions. Mavrik or mavrik means brilliant. Okay, not necessarily emotions, but certainly emotive. Um, mavrik comes from the same root, bet reish kuf, as barak. Barak is lightning. Okay, so a flash of something is brilliant. Mavrik is brilliant to cause something to become shiny or brilliant, mavrik. Mavrik is also means shiny, okay? And it ends, as you see here with the hey, so mavrika, mavrikim, mavrikot. Magniv, we've talked about this word before in slang. This is also an important word to nail in slang, although you're probably not gonna use the slang version so often. However, it does reemphasize for all of us the importance of pronunciation. The word is magniv. Remember that in modern Hebrew, most words are stressed on the last syllable, not the second to last syllable. Second to last syllable is indicative, is common among um, Ashkenazi Jews in speaking in Yiddish and also in Hebrew. In modern Hebrew, the compromise was made with um, Jews, uh, Svaradi Jews, Magniv. Okay, the emphasis is on the last syllable. So Magniv is captivating. It comes from the same root as um, lignov, to steal. So this is causing to steal something, literally causing to steal something. It is captivating. It is worth to hold captive. It's a great um, origin of this word, magniv, that we use all the time, just like mavrik, and just like our next one to mean amazing. Or you are amazing, or I'm amazing, or they're amazing, or I'm great. You can use all these words to fill in, like I said, for tov, Mitsuyan, all of those sort of boring words of good or excellent or very good. Mavrik, magniv, magniva, magnivim, magnivot. Or our last one, maxim. 
Ah, sorry, before we get to that, the slang version of magniv is magniv, right? Where the emphasis is on the first syllable. Magniv is someone who is really full of themselves and thinks that they are the coolest person around. Okay, think of it like a poser. Um, think of it like a, um, that, what's that line from um, that description of Kramer in Seinfeld, a hipster doofus? That is a magniv. But magniv is um, brilliant. Magniv, uh, sorry, yeah, magniv is captivating. Magniv is a poser. Our third word here is maxim. Maxim has the root of kuf samech mem, which shares the same root with the word kesem. Kesem is magic. Kosem is a magician. Kesem is magic. So maxim is enchanting to cause magic to happen or to cause magic on someone else, to make magic on someone else is what it literally translates to. But we use an everyday meaning as enchanting, but it can simply mean really good. Okay, so these three words, mavrik, magniv, maxim, you can hear how they all have the same mishkal, they have the same format of taking the sholesh and creating those vowels and extra letters that indicate a same sound, mavrik, Magniv, Maxim, they all come from a very specific um, mishkal, that form that we talked about the other week. And all of these, like I said, are adjectives. So in this case, Maxim, enchanting, Mavrik, brilliant, Magniv, captivating, but they can all mean really good. Okay, so never ever think of saying Tov Me'od. Now you have a much better way, a much more illustrative way to say how well you're doing or not. You could certainly add lo, not, in front of any of these, and you could also say the same thing as lo mashu. Very important point to make. Okay, let's get into what I was saying before, was intimating before, is when verbs are also part of the emotive um, spectrum. That's a really important point. We've talked about this a lot. Hebrew is very um, conservative when it comes to words. There are now verbs that you can use to indicate specific emotions, and we're going to go through some of them. Again, there are many, 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 many words for emotions in Hebrew. I'm not going through all of them together, right? There are words for pompous, and there's words for arrogant and confident and um, depressed and exhausted, and all of those words, you can look them up. I'm giving you the general framework for how to understand how these words are used, adjectives, and now we're going to go into verbs, and very important to look at how verbs are formed with emotions in in mind, as well as um, adjectives and even nouns from it. So let's look at our first one, row 25, lismoach. You know this root, sin mem chet, has something to do with being happy. In this case, lismoach is to become happy. We've talked about this verb before, and it's a very important verb because we use it all the time in Hebrew. This verb in particular, and please note this if you're taking notes or if you're making screenshots or write it to yourself, and certainly you can come back to the recording on YouTube to remind you of this important note. Lismoach is only used in the past and the future tenses. Okay, we only use it then. So if I want to say, I was happy to see you yesterday. Samachti lirot otcha etmol. I was happy to see you yesterday. Or, and we talked about this last week, right? Toda um, merosh, the expression toda merosh, thanks in advance. Esmach lishmoa mimcha behekdem. We also talked about behekdem. Esmach, the future tense, I would be happy to hear from you behekdem shortly. Okay, toda merosh, esmach lishmoa mimcha behekdem. Thanks in advance. Um, thanks in advance. Be happy to hear from you soon. Okay, so either I was happy, or I would be happy, or I will be happy. Okay, if you're gonna say I am happy, present tense, you're gonna skip down to what you, I'm sure, all know already, row 27, samer, which is the adjective, right? Because remember, there is no to be in the present tense. So if I want to say I am happy, ani samer. But if I want to say I'm happy that you came, you're going to use the past tense. Samachti shabata. I'm happy that you, singular masculine, came. Okay, so I'm going to conjugate this verb only in the past or in the future to indicate I was happy or I was very recently happy or I will be happy. 
or I would be happy. Okay, really good use of a verb here to indicate emotion. Instead of just saying ani margish samer or ani samer or haiti samer, I was happy. Now you can say samachti, I was happy or I became happy. Okay, another form of this verb is lisamer. Lismoach, for those of you who are a little bit more advanced, this is the pa'al version of the root, row 25. Row 26 is pl. Lisamer is to make someone happy. Right? Many of you know this verb from a Jewish wedding. It is in one of the, um, you hear this multiple times during a wedding. Um, um, it's a prayer that said as much about God, may God make the bride and groom happy, as well as the congregation, the people, the, the congregants, the participants in the wedding. Lisamer is to make someone else happy. Okay? So very important distinction to become happy myself, or to make someone else happy, le samer. The adjective, like I talked about before, is samer. As you see here on the left-hand side, it's got a hey. So samer, smecha, smechim, smechot. And then finally, the noun. The state of being happy, aka happiness, simcha. Okay, very important. I talked about emphasis on syllables before. In modern Hebrew, simcha. Simcha is both happiness as well as a happy occasion. Okay, if you say simcha, it's not that they're not gonna that people aren't gonna understand you. It's just not modern Hebrew. Okay, so if someone is not coming from an Ashkenazi background, simcha is gonna come across like either you're speaking in Yiddish, or you're simply using a word that you learned from abroad here, and it's not modern Hebrew. Simcha is the equivalent of simcha in modern Hebrew. Very important distinction, but it is an important, small distinction, but it is important, rather. Let's get to not necessarily the opposite of l'samer, of l'ismoach, but pretty close, which is l'ichos. L'ichos, to become angry. Just like l'ismoach, the pa'al form, was to become happy, l'ichos is to become angry. Okay? So to become angry, ka'asti. I became angry in the past, aniko es, which is much the verb as it is, you'll see soon the adjective. And, excuse me, ani ech as. You'll rarely hear this, for, this form in the future tense, but I shall become angry. I will become angry. Okay? And then, just like we had lismoach and lesameach, we have lichos and lehach is. It's important when we're talking about emotions, not just about how we're, we're feeling, but not only, and not only how others are feeling, but maybe how we're causing them to feel as well, right? We're not just alone in our emotions here and what we um, uh, do and say, there's also ramifications. Lehach is is to anger someone. Okay, so mitzta'er shehich asti otcha. I'm sorry that I angered you. Okay, that's the use of this verb, is to cause someone else to be angry. Okay, whereas lichos is I became, is about yourself or talking about someone specifically, they became angry. The adjective, like I just said before, is koes. Koes, and you see here, it's got a taf. Um, so koes, koeset for female, koasim, koasot, all mean angry as an adjective. And finally, anger, the state of being angry is ka'as. Okay, so just like with the first one for samer, we've taken the same root um, in four different ways to use it differently to express an emotion, right? We did that before with samer, with sin, mem, chet, to give us to become happy, to make someone happy, happy as an adjective, happy as a noun. Now we have it for anger, right? Kaf ein samech has something to do with anger. And now we have to become angry, to anger someone, angry and anger. Very conservative, very efficient use of the Hebrew language. Let's keep going with some other words. Again, we're not going through the full spectrum of emotions, but we're going through some of the big ones that you're going to hear on a regular basis. As equally important as I keep emphasizing, listen and look at the pattern of the words, because the next few examples are going to be really sticking to a pattern. Really important that you pay attention to that pattern or recognize it on your own. Let's start with this root. 
This root is a unique root. This is one of the rare four letter roots. So in this case, it's Aleph Chaf Zain Bet. So you see here, let me just highlight that. Aleph Chaf Zain Bet is the root here. Okay, all four letters have to be included in this order, maybe with some helper letters in the middle that indicate that mishkal, that way that you say the word, but this is the root. And let's start with le'achzev. Le'achzev is to disappoint, meaning to disappoint someone or something. I am actively disappointing someone. Okay, again, mitzta'er she'ichzavti otcha. I'm sorry that I disappointed you. Notice I'm not going to conjugate all these verbs. That great website, E-A-L-I-M.com, is your online guide to um, conjugation. I'm just pointing out the infinitives here because it's easier to go through them. And this is also how you'll often see verbs listed. Le'achzev is to disappoint. The flip side, to become disappointed. Remember, we had all these examples just now of to become happy or to make someone else happy. It's the same thing here, slightly different forms. To disappoint versus to become disappointed. Those are two different states, just like in English, so too in Hebrew. So to disappoint, I disappoint versus I became disappointed. Those are two very different experiences, right? Both are emotive, just who is active and who's causing the disappointment is important to pay attention. So le'achzev is to disappoint, to become or to get disappointed is lehit achzev. Okay, lehit achzev, to become or to get disappointed. Okay, let's go through some, again, just like we did with the others, nouns and adjectives, or in this case, adjectives and nouns. Me'ochzav is disappointed and me'achzev is disappointing. This is a really important distinction, folks. We've talked about this before, the idea of both the passive voice and also the importance of the participle. Participles in Hebrew play a big role. You'll see a lot of these um, uh, adjectives, these emotions that we've been using are actually participles because they can describe someone, they can be also a person, or they can represent an object, or they can sometimes even be an adverb. Participles are common throughout Hebrew and the way that we form them it's just the same way that we form nouns and adjectives. So it's, it further emphasizes the importance of understanding how these words are used. In this case, I'm using them as adjectives. So the past or passive participle is disappointed, right? Of the verb to disappoint is disappointed, which is me'uchzav, right? So I could say either, ani hitachzavti, I became disappointed, or I can say I was disappointed. A small nuance, but an important nuance if that's in terms of time. I was disappointed. Right? I'm using, in this case, the adjective, the participle to describe how I was. Or I became disappointed. Just like in English, excuse me, so too do you have the choice in English and Hebrew to say I was disappointed versus I became disappointed. There is a difference there. I leave it to you to make that difference for yourself, just like you do in English. The other flip of disappointed is something that is disappointing. Me'achzev. Okay. So for example, if I can't meet someone at the last minute and I write them um, in Hebrew that I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm unable to meet, and they say that's disappointing, they could simply write me'achzev aval muvan, right? A very cold but understanding reply, disappointing but understood. Me'achzev aval muvan. Okay, it's all in the me'achzev, um, excuse me, aval muvan, disappointing but understood. They could also write ani me'achzev aval I'm disappointed, but I can understand. Either of those are many different examples of how to use disappointed or disappointing, just like in English, we use the two. And the noun, the act of the state of being disappointed is disappointment. This is a great word that we use. You'll hear it in a lot of songs in Hebrew, um, especially when we get very emotive in some songs. Um, there's a very famous song 
um, and it talks about ahava me'ach zevet, disappointing love. Talk about emotional spectrum. There it is. Okay, let's get to another one. Um, full disclosure: not all these are the most positive words, um, but that is life. You're not I'm, again. I'm not asking you to use these words necessarily, but you certainly need to recognize them. And you can always add lo at the beginning of a word to try to make it less negative, if that's at all possible. Um, and hopefully it is. Right? Okay. Another root. This root is ein sali sadi. Bet. And in this case, it has the helper letter of nun to indicate um, it's used slightly different here. This is one that you've heard probably a lot, and you've heard it from um, your kids or your grandkids or kids on the street speaking to their parents. Um, this is one that we use all the time. Le'atzben. Le'atzben is to annoy someone. Okay, and the flip side of that is lehit atzben. Row 42, le'atzben is to annoy versus le'hitatzben is to become annoyed or to get annoyed. All right, so important who's doing the annoying here. Um, who's being annoying, who's being annoyed, Duh. okay? And the adjective is atzbani, okay? Atzbani means cranky or nervous. You could also say anxious, but it's really cranky or nervous. Um, and that shows the origin of this word. This, the actual origin of this word is a three-letter root. It's ein tzadi bet. Atzavim are nerves, both emotional but also physical nerves in your body, is atzavim. We add the helper letter nun at the end to create this sense of nervousness or annoyance, right? Your nerves are overreacting. Um, or they're reacting too much, or they're just acting. So to annoy, let's ben. Um, you've probably heard this a lot in the street. Atamats benoti, you are annoying me. Now you know how what what they were saying when they were screaming it. Um, and now you know how to say it also to loved ones or perhaps not so loved ones um, who are using this. Okay, let's ben to annoy. Lehitats ben to become annoyed. Atzbani is the adjective, and you see here there's a taf on the left-hand side. So atzbani for man, atzbanit for woman, atzbaniim, atzbaniot. And the state of being annoyed or cranky is atzbanut. Okay? This is the word that you're going to hear the most when we're talking about emotions. Before people raise their hands and say, well, wait a minute, I know another verb that also means to annoy or to bother. We're only talking about let's ben because it really has to do with annoyance. And that's the best way to translate this specific verb. And finally, we talked about this ver these two verbs the other week, but it's good to go over when we're talking about emotions. Emotions sometimes get out of hand. Sometimes we're feeling these emotions as we're talking. Also good to um, have a reminder of these two verbs. Lehitzta'el and lehit natsel. They mean two different things, like we talked about the other week, but important ones to know. Lehit sta'el is to be sorry for something. Okay, to show or to have sorrow over something is lehit sta'el. That is not the same thing as lehit natsel. Lehit natsel is to apologize. Right? So, for example, using some of the verbs, the words we just had, ani mit natsel. I'm sorry that I annoyed you. Great use of the vocabulary right now. Okay, so sorry, just leaning back so I can cross my legs. To apologize, lehitzta'er is to be sorry, right? Just because you're sorry doesn't mean you're apologizing. Um, so that's the difference there, just like in English, so too in Hebrew. You could also say, I'm sorry that I annoyed you. Or you could say, I'm not sorry that I annoyed you, if that's the um, gist of the conversation. The point, though, is you can hear and see the very similar mishkalim, the formats of the words that are being used here to describe both the um, action of being a certain emotion or carrying out a certain emotion or demonstrating an emotion versus the descriptive part, the adjective or the noun, right? The act of being disappointed versus being disappointed. Okay, excuse me. Very important words here. Again, 
This is only a small sample of the many, many, many Hebrew words we have for emotions. Many of them you can look up. These are some of the um, words that we use on a regular basis here in everyday Hebrew. I'm going to stop here and start taking some questions in the Q&A. If you have a question, please write in the Q&A. I will only be looking there. Um, Anonymous asks a great question here. Can you ask Echata Malgish about someone's state of health? Absolutely. Like I said before, emotive and physical health get um, uh, intertwined in Hebrew, just like they do in English. How you feel can be both physical or um, emotional. It can be both. Um, so absolutely, it can be how do you feel and with regards to one's health. Okay. Um, Shira, um, simply you would say, um, is asking about the word achla. You would just say achla, right? Um, when you're talking about yourself, um, you don't even use the, uh, the, excuse me, the pronoun ani. If someone asks you, echat malgisha shira, or shira echat malgisha, shira, how do you feel? Achla. You could also say ani achla, but simply saying achla, is the same answer, I'm awesome, I'm feeling great. It's not I'm awesome, by the way, it's I'm feeling awesome, because it's in the context of how do you feel. I see people are writing in their own adjectives. I'm so glad that you're writing them all in. Yes, Philip, me'ule means excellent. Yes, Ellen, Madhi means amazing. Again, folks, there are many, many, many adjectives out there, even many more that describe tov and tov me'od out there. I'm not going through all of them. You can look many of these up. I'm glad to know that some of you already know some of these. Me'ule with an ayin is excellent or superior or amazing. Madhim from Ellen is also amazing. Mitsuyan, yes, we talked about. Shira, I was happy. You could say Shira, let me, let's go back to that. Great question. You could say Samachti, but Samachti is used in the context of a larger statement. When we're using a verb here to indicate emotion, there's something else going on, like those sample sentences I gave. I was happy to hear from you. I was happy to see you yesterday. It's not asking, not how did you feel yesterday, right? If someone asks you, how did you feel yesterday, Shira? You're going to answer smecha, if you were happy or lo smecha. Okay, you're simply answering with regards to it. And it's like answering, um, how are you feeling? Happy. Or how are you feeling? Not so happy. Lismoach is used as a verb, just like we use a verb in any other context, meaning it's part of a fuller sentence. You would not simply say samachti. Samachti would have to refer to a more specific context of you are happy in a specific context of a spe specific instance or an action that took place. Samach, the adjective or smecha, is the one that we use to indicate I was happy. Okay, haiti smecha, I was happy for a woman. That's, that would be a full sentence. Samachti is referring to some other context we have yet to hear about. Okay, or for example, I'll give you an example from the future tense. Um, I was, where was I today? I was in the store, I was in Superfound, you know, the big conglomerate um, pharmacy here in Israel. And they asked me at the end, um, very nice kupait, a very nice um, cashier woman asking me all sorts of things and um, how is it going to pay and things like that. And she asked me at the end, do you want your um, receipt? And I did not answer Ken. Instead, I answered the very polite esmach. Esmach, I would be happy, right? But it's not out of context because it's, I would be happy to receive the Kabbalah that you just offered me, right? I would be happy to receive the receipt that you just offered me. I'm replying directly to that. It is not a yesamech. It is esmach. I shall become happy if you, I will become happy, or I will be happy if you give me the receipt. It's a very nice way to say Ken. Just an extra few words in there for you to use, but yes. Um, Naomi asks, can you please, please add the prepositions to be disappointed with or in? Great question. Um, 
to be disappointed, to become disappointed, is going to be followed by the letter B. Just like in English, I'm, I was disappointed in you. We use the equivalent of in in Hebrew, which is be. Hitachzavti becha. Or I was disappointed with you, in which case it's going to be, excuse me, mean. Hitachzavti mimcha. I was disappointed with you, or I was disappointed in you. I hitachzavti becha. Okay, either way, just like in English, I was disappointed in you, if you're saying it to a man, or I became disappointed with you, okay, in that case, let me write it here as a sample sentence, both of them, sorry, just one second, Zavti hit ach zavti becha or hit ach zavti imcha. Okay, in this case, I was disappointed in you, male. It actually doesn't matter because they're both spelled the same way based on regardless of gender, or I was disappointed with you. Okay. Thank you for asking that question about pronouns. Um, again, it has to do with who is the person who is um, doing it. So for example, um, these verbs like le'achzev, le'atzben, lichos, lismoach, things that have a direct correlation to someone is going to use a direct object. So more often than not, it's going to be followed by et and then a direct object. Okay, ichzavti otcha, I disappointed you. Otcha, direct object, you. Okay, great question. Thank you for asking, Naomi. Okay, I see a lot of people asking again. Write it down, folks. P E A L I M dot com. Pe alim dot com. Okay, pe alim means verbs in Hebrew. P E A L I M dot com. If you didn't get that, the recording will give it to you in a few days' time. Um, Shira, I received a cup that says Ahlali. Um, what does this mean? It's not a regular um, Ahlali, it's good to me. It's all good for me, um, is what that would mean, Ahlali. But you don't normally hear that expression when we use the word Ahla. Uh, okay. Uh, question again, it's just a housekeeping rule. You're welcome to screenshot any of these. And again, you can go back to the recording in a few days time. You'll be able to screenshot all of this or just pause and write down the words yourself, just like old school being in school. All right, hold on. I'm just going through some of these that I haven't answered yet in my comments. Okay, Stuart asks a great question about chaval al-azman. All right, we talked about chaval al-azman here, meaning both bad in the literal sense and bad in the slang sense. Chaval al-azman is also um, abbreviated because it's otherwise chaval al-azman, five syllables, then can be shortened into the uh, acronym, because we've talked about this a lot, that Hebrew loves acronyms. Sorry. Chavlaz. Chavlaz. Chavlaz, you'll hear this. People will say it. They won't usually write it out. Chavlaz stands for Chaval al -Azman. Right, because two syllables always is better than five syllables in Hebrew. Chavlaz or chavlazi, adding a yud at the end to indicate that it's an adjective, both mean awesome. Chavlaz, by the way, when you hear it as an 
uh, abbreviation like this will mean bad in the good sense, not bad in the bad sense. Great question. Thank you for asking. I'm always up for slang. Uh, OK. Uh, Andrew asks, how do you say to a doctor that hurts or that doesn't feel right? Andrew, we've actually done a um, lesson about doctors and general medical vocabulary, so I refer you to the YouTube website. But if you just want to say zekoev, um, this hurts, or something hurts me, zemachiv, or just using our verb lehalgish, right? This doesn't feel right. Zelo malgish tov, right? Again, malgish get, can get used in everyday Hebrew to mean both emotional as well as physical pain. But when we're talking about emotions, we're only going to use lehalgish. Very important distinction. Just because Hebrew and Hebrew speakers use it for physical as well as emotional doesn't mean that we can use all the different verbs that indicate to feel as such. Only one that we use for emotions is lehalgish. Okay, let me just make sure. Just a few more questions here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I see a lot of people asking again for the 50th time for the website. It is a great website, folks. So I will write it in the description when this video goes up on YouTube. Okay, but peilim.com. Can't say it enough times. Can't share how good it is enough. Okay, um, let me just make sure I get some of the big ones here. Eva, I've seen slicha translated as sorry, meets da er is apologize. Um, Eva, like I explained, lehitz da er is I am sorry, is to become sorry. Slicha means forgiveness, meaning sorry in the sense of excuse me. Okay, we've talked about that word a lot before, but lehitz da er literally means to become sorry. Sa'ar is sorrow in Hebrew. Lehid style is to become sorrowed, in this case, sorry, in better English. Okay, okay we're at the top of the hour. So with that, we're going to break here. Todalabad um, for all of you joining us. I do want to just point out, we went through these emotional, um, some of these words for emotions and feelings. Next week is going to be a difficult class, not difficult in terms of the uh, grammar of the words, um, of the, what we're gonna go over, but it's gonna be difficult over the topic we're gonna go over, which is how do we talk about each other in, in Israel, specifically about identity and minorities, um, owing to the fact that all of us who have made Aliyah were formerly minorities in whatever country we're coming from. And now we are the majority here, but we understand that um, being a minority. And it's important to know all the different identities we have here as Israeli citizens, whether it's religious, whether it's um, gender-based, whether it's all sorts of different things. We're gonna go through the words that are acceptable and the words that are 100% totally unacceptable to use in Israeli society in Hebrew. Those are important to know. Um, even if you don't feel comfortable enough to call someone out when they're using a word, and although Israeli society is not as politically correct as some others around the world, it is important to know there are some hard red lines in Israeli society um, of words that should not be used in any context. Um, and we're going to point those out with big red letters around it we're using these for illustrative purposes only. So with that, thank you all so much for joining. This lesson will be up in the next few days, and we will see you all next week here at Cafe Ole. See you all very soon.